Barbara Kurja. I move that the question be now put. Stuart Nash. Thank you very much, Mr Chair. Mr Chair, I'd just like to finish elaborating on the um, example I gave earlier. There is a clause in the bill which basically says um, um, that uh, resident withholding tax, well, first and foremost, must be paid after the New Zealand mortgage is paid off. However, if, um, if this would result in sufficient funds being made available to pay resident land withholding tax, the amount of resident land withholding tax payable will be restricted to the difference between the current purchase price and the amount required to discharge the mortgage. And the thing that we, we talked about in the select committee about this is how would that sort of situation arise? Now, let me give you an example. Uh, you, you, uh, an investor buys a property for a million dollars, sells it uh, 18 months later for $1.5 million. Not unheard of in any way, shape or form. Um, so they have made a, a profit of $500,000. If it's a company, there's $140,000 tax liability there. But the interesting thing about this is for this clause to come into play, there would have to be a New Zealand mortgage of 1.36, or a mortgage above, $1.36 million. And I'm not too sure how that could arise unless there was some sort of negative gearing going on. And negative gearing in the property market could, could never happen, could it? Could never happen. I remember Mr Chair trying to buy a house in Auckland at one point in time and I thought I'd put in a very good price. It had a valuation of about 700000 It was a long time ago and I told that it had, uh, the guy had a $1.7, um, sorry, $1.5 million mortgage against it. It was a well-known property developer and he had just geared this up. So we just have to be a little bit careful about the games people play and I suppose, as Jacinda Ardern has just outlined, uh, there are those who will, um, who will seek to game the system no matter what. Mr Speaker, I think it is probably worth looking at the definition of residential land in New Zealand, because we probably all have, a, have, a, um, uh, have an ordinary person's, have a reasonable person's definition of residential land, but it is slightly, um, it's slightly more complicated than that. So the definition of residential land is land that has a dwelling on it. Well, that makes sense. That's, what, that's I suppose, what we would, would automatically assume. But it's also um, land for which the owner has an arrangement that relates to erecting a dwelling, i.e. Uh, an, an investor has bought um, a bare piece of land upon which there are plans and consents to put a dwelling. Uh, the dwelling perhaps does not go up. The investor sells that piece of that bare piece of land within 18 months. Well, that is still classed as residential land. Um, bare land that may be used uh, for erecting a dwelling under the rules in the relevant operative district plan. So again, this relates to a circumstance where perhaps uh, an overseas investor has bought a chunk of land upon which they were planning to put six units. Uh, that doesn't go ahead. Um, the land is sold, the units were not erected, well that is still classed as residential land and, the, and an investor still has to pay um, resident land withholding tax on that. And the other thing is, does not include land that is farmland or used predominantly as business per, uh, premises. And again, we sought clarification around what predominantly business premises were and we think we came to an elegant solution, but by and large, uh, those other three definitions will preclude farmland and, and commercial property. Um, uh, there is one thing, uh, note that the reference to income under the Brightline test means that there will not need to be a land title transfer. Okay, ordinarily with the sale and purchase of a house there's a transfer and that triggers, uh, well, it, it, it triggers the sale. But there will only need to be a residential land purchase amount. And there's a little bit of a nuance there, but it's important, I suppose, that we understand this, and certainly conveyances are undertaking this, if in fact they, um, they believe that it doesn't kick in because there hasn't been a land act transfer, it, it still triggers. Um, this means that, for example, off the plan sales for, uh, will still be subject to resident land withholding tax if conditions are also met. The other thing is, and um, it's been brought up before, <clears throat> the Brightline test does contain an exception if the residential land has been disposed of, it's the vendor's main home. There is, of course, no main home exemption in this, because we are in, in this Act, in the Resident Land Withholding Tax Act, because we are only talking about overseas investors. So, by any definition, an overseas investor buying a New Zealand property could not claim that that is their main home because they don't live in it. Makes sense. Um, the other thing is uh, there will be an exemptional rollover from relief of resident land withholding tax for inherited property and for transfers of relationship property under the Brightline test. Again, keeping in mind that we're only talking about a two-year window here. And so I suppose if someone dies within two years of buying a property and their, 
in their estate or, or members of their um, or beneficiaries of their will and here at that property there is no uh, there is no liability triggered however there is still a two year so mr chair phil twyford the members uh, 